<laughs> okay, I'm glad that uh, many of you or uh, everybody made it back from the <laughs> So Josh will entertain us with his uh, third lecture in the series. So Josh, take it away. Thank you. Um, and I, like I announced yesterday, I'm planning to run up the mountain tomorrow morning. And anybody's welcome to come. Um, and I'm going to leave at six from the coffee machine at the end of this building. And, and it'll just be up and down the same route. So, so if you want to turn around or wait, there's a lot of options and we'll kind of wait for people. And it'll really be running is kind of aspirational. It'll be a run slash hike up and then run down um, back for breakfast. There would be a slow group. <laughs> 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 so 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 you don't have to tell me whether you're coming or not because we'll leave at six uh, if there's myself if, if there's something me <laughs> hopefully some of you will join me okay um but if you have any questions then you can talk to me between now and then okay so um this continuing our discussion about thermal relics before we go even further afield um and remember these lectures are about ways to make dark matter and we started with the the wimp and then I'm sort of moving further and further away from the WIMP in theory space. So this schematic is a way of explaining that. So, so we started here, um, but really the WIMP is just one type of thermal relic among a bro much broader set of ideas, which really involves a series of assumptions that one makes. Um, so so um, we're still in this lecture going to be talking about thermal relics that have a temperature. Um, we'll now start to ask if that will allow the temperature to depart from standard model temperatures. Um, but in general, there's some temperature. Um, we are assuming there's no dark matter asymmetry. And then all of the mechanisms we talked about this morning furthermore assume that some two to two reaction is what is responsible for dark matter number changing processes in the early universe. And even then, there were a lot of ideas, there were a lot of possibilities that I enumerated bed insemination, co annihilation, co scattering. Um, and these are really the closest to, to the WIMP. And now what I want to do is talk about some of these other thermal things that are a little further away. And, and then by tomorrow and Friday, we'll be in the non-thermal land. So, so that's just to orient you where we are and where we're going. Okay. So, so far, it's been all two to two. It doesn't need to be two to two. So what about three to two? Um, these models are also called SIMPs, and I think you'll have some lectures just about SIMPs later in this school. Okay, and um, this name SIMP is in this paper by Yoni and collaborators. She'll be the one talking to you. 2014. And well, the idea is simple enough that you have a three to two. And the neat thing is now it can be all dark matter in the diagram. This wasn't relevant for two to two because then it would just be two dark matter go to two dark matter and it wouldn't change the number. But but this changes the number. And if this is faster than Hubble, it sets the dark matter chemical potential to zero. Um, okay. So we can analyze this in a similar, very similar way. There'll be a Boltzmann equation with the usual left hand side. And now um, there'll be a term for three to two, and then a term for two to three. And you could use detailed balance and write it just in terms of the three to two. And I'll jump right to that step. Um, when it's three to two, one dark matter needs to find two more. And it ends up that sigma v squared um, is now the right quantity since there's sort of two. Um, vectors that describe the two incoming things. Um, now we have an n pi cubed. And then after applying detailed balance, the reverse process, the reverse term will look like that. And well, otherwise, it's really the same type of thermal. Yeah, sorry. Uh, why wouldn't you go the other way with detailed balance so you didn't have this weird sigma v squared? Like, why would you substitute in the sigma v from the two to three? You absolutely could do that. So you could write this all in terms of this. Um, but then it's going to be a forbidden process because you have more 
mass here than, than here, and, and then you'd have to um, be careful with the thermal average okay. keeping track of there'd be an exponential appearing in the thermal average. So, so going this way, since it's allowed at zero temperature, this, this thing um, is, is not going to have an exponential. So it, it's actually simpler okay. th th this way, even though it's unfamiliar. Yeah, it, it, but I'll, I'll, I'll sort of explain how to think about this parametrics in a moment. Okay, so it's, it's, it's still the usual thermal relic story will apply here. Um, you're going to be in equilibrium when this is fast, and then you're going to freeze out. Um, now the freeze out condition looks a little different. It has an n pi squared, sigma v squared. The cross section for a 3 2 process has mass dimension one over mass to the bit, unlike a, when you have two initial state, it's one over mass squared, um, but now it's one over mass to the fifth. So, and then you have an n chi squared here equals Hubble. This is the freeze out condition. And then to compute the abundance, you can just again solve this for n chi to tell you the number density at, at the freeze out moment. So let's do that. So we have omega. So as usual, it's going to be mass times yield, the pure marking at the back of the envelope level. So it's one over T quality. This is just n chi over entropy T quality, just plugging the definition of, of yield. And now um, we can evaluate this expression at freeze out by solving this for n. We get I over S to equality. Now a square root appears. That's the different from the one case um, where there was just one N. Okay. And then we can proceed like before. Um, we'll just step back at the envelope level. The entropy will go like T cubed. Hubble goes like T squared over M plane. This will happen at temperatures near the dark matter mass. When the exponential Boltzmann shuts things off and plugging in these very rough estimates, we get following M chi equality. Now it has an M plane to one half, they can be squared to the one half to get the following expression. Which, if you contrast this, if you recall the WIMP case, it was just T quality M blank sigma V. And now it's this function, which has this M, M blank is to a different power, and the cross section is two different power. So all the same um, characters appear, but with different weights now, um, just following from, from dimensions, really. Perfect. Yes. Are you it's not clear for me why it is sigma v squared instead of just sigma v. Well, because there's two things that you have to hit, so there's now two vectors that describe it, and you know, the dimensions will be different. But yeah, yeah. So before you're just one dark matter, and then you're asking for for hitting one, and that has a velocity at you. Now you need to find you need to find two simultaneously for convex interaction. Add to the relative. Yeah, so, so you can, it's a little complicated how to actually define it correctly, which I'm sweeping under the rug here, but it ends up clearly these two vectors. I can point you to references if anybody's interested in how to technically compute this and specific examples, maybe after. Yeah. Um, in, in this case, sigma is not unique to uh, normal cross section, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it has, uh, yeah, and I'm just going to say it in a second. Um, it had, yeah, so let's estimate it. Yeah, and then the way we would estimate, so now it's going to have um, more powers of coupling. So it ends up being alpha D and it'll go like M pi to the fifth. Those are the right units here. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I was thinking about how to interpret it because it's not like an area, it's like a double area, right? It's an area times a volume. Mm, I see. It has the right units, fortunately, so that this makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> and that's really all you need to know for, for this discussion. Um, okay, so now if you plug this expression here and solve for M, then you can predict the mass scale where this will have the observed dark matter abundance. And doing this, you will find this linear in alpha 
and then you now get a sort of generalized geometric mean that looks like the following. And if you remember for the WIM, this um, alpha D and then just geometric mean T-quality on plane. And now you have this generalized geometric mean that places more weight on T-quality than on plane. This is an EV, it's 10 to 19 GV, so it's pushing the mass scale down since it's putting more weight on the smaller scale thing entering. And indeed, this um, will be well, sort of alpha D roughly times GV scale. So, so now if it's strongly coupled, it would have to be a GEV scale mass. And if alpha D is weakly coupled, it can go lighter. Uh, yeah. Um, can you understand why it makes sense for T-quality to have more weight than M plane? Why it makes more? Well, it's, let's see, it, it, it's lighter. I mean, I mean, three, three to two is harder to do. So, so you need sort of more cross-section to have enough. On, uh, like, like you need, uh, yeah, which manifests in the M squared here. So, so the like the like the the higher number of ends you put in the initial state, you're always going to have one M plank on the right hand side, and then more ends here, which is going to lead to more powers of T quality when you solve around. Okay, so like you need you need more energy, more temperature to be able to do the three two. That... Yeah, three. You, the number of densities are small okay. when you're non-relativistic. So 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 to do to find three of them at the same point, there's a suppression, and you need to compensate that with a larger cross section. Okay. Which corresponds to a smaller mass scale, which puts more weight on T quality. Okay, that makes sense. And if you've done four to two or five to two, which you can also contemplate, you're just going to get higher and higher powers here, compensating the suppression and finding these extra particles in the initial state. Okay. Yeah, the why do they call this SIMP? SIMP is strongly interacting massive particle because the, in the Wimp miracle, you get weak scale, and GEV is sort of the scale of strong interactions, although they're not necessarily connected. Um, so I'm not, not a big fan of the name actually, but it sounds cool. Okay. Any questions about three or two? Yes. Okay. Um, oh, then, well, they have to be bosons, of course, because there's yeah. five. Because I'm asking for how to get an alpha to um, I mean, the matrix element would be, yeah, you need matrix element squared in order to get the cross section. So, let's see. So, I know if I have a three point, point, if I have a three point and a four point, I can do it. I'm not sure. Um, and there's an example. So, here I have a scalar that has a three point self interaction and a four point interaction. So, if I have like a scalar with a cordic and a cubic interaction, then I can generate this. This is, say, some scalar. So, so if I have um, both a phi to the fourth and a phi cubed, then I will generate three to two. So in fact, a real scalar with generic interactions will do this. Um, you could think of it as a glue ball in some confining sector. And there are explicit models that 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 where, where these are pions and this phi plane interaction comes from some West Sigma Witten term. I'm sure you and you will tell you about those models. So the types of are different topics. Yeah, because here the cordic sort of has more weight. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, this alpha is very schematic. So so just uh, it'll have higher powers of coupling versus yeah, yeah. versus a contact interaction. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think of a cortic is having one more coupling than a cubic. Okay. Um any more questions about three two? Okay. Um good. Next will be asymmetric. And so far, we've not allowed for a dark matter asymmetry, but in general, if there is a dark matter particle and any particle that are different, then they could have an asymmetry, just like baryons and antibaryons have an asymmetry that leads to there being baryons now. Um, this is an old idea of the sort of paper that coined the term. That's quite nice. Is, uh, um, and if you're familiar with baryogenesis, just port all that knowledge over to dark sector and you're done. Um, what, 
So there is a variant on asymmetry. Evidently. So we can write this as the number of baryons minus the number of antivaryons is um, greater than zero. Some process that is unknown to us produced this asymmetry at early times, and then the variant and antivaryons annihilate. And then you're just left with the asymmetry sort of after the number of antivaryons becomes very small. The number of variants are just left with the residual variants encoded by this asymmetry. And we can write omega baryon a square. We can use the same expression we've been using for, for, for dark matter, um, which applies here too. So we can write in terms of entropy and critical density. And then um, now it's sort of the asymmetry yield that it should multiply. Where this quantity will be constant in, as the universe red shifts. Um, so it's, it's a co moving baryon asymmetry times the baryon mass. So I'll just write the proton mass for simplicity. In reality, the proton and neutron have slightly different masses, but it's a small factor. And this we observe to be 0 0.022. Um, and then this is just a way of normalizing the size of the co moving baryon asymmetry that had to be generated early in the universe. If you're familiar with this, I'm not going to go into baryogenesis in detail, but you have to satisfy something called Sekharov conditions. You should have equilibrium process. You should violate CT and, and charge symmetry. Um, there are many ways to do that. Um, so the idea of asymmetric dark matter is to assume the same set of things applies also to, to dark matter. Maybe there's also a dark matter asymmetry. Um, so I'll call this, say, nx minus nx bar shows that this is greater than zero. Then the dark matter and anti dark matter will annihilate. And if it has a large annihilation rate, then you're just going to be left today with the asymmetric component, like for baryons. And then we can write the same equation um, for, for dark matter. And if you can form, say, the ratio, dark matter. Um, and then this three factor would cancel out since it's the same for both. And the entities cancel out. So you can write this as a number of, um, that is the dark matter asymmetry divided by the baryon asymmetry times the dark matter mass over the proton mass. Um, and this also, so the dark matter one is. 0.11, so the ratio is about five. This needs to be five point three, and then this lets you write this. So the sum relation, if if, if if both of these are order, if both these ratios are order one, then you would get an order one number here, and then that would actually explain why we see a similar omega dark matter and omega baryon, which is sort of a coincidence from the point of view of the thermal relic models I've presented so far. Um, if these are both order one numbers. Um, the, actually, the reality is a lot of the models for this don't explain why this would be order one. Um, there are some that do. Yeah. Um, are those um, asymmetry values set or constant? Are they exactly constant? I would think that they would be changing slightly. The, this is constant as long as there's no process violating baryon number after the asymmetry has been generated. Then it's exactly constant because the only if there's no processes violating baryon number in the late universe, okay. then then the only thing that changes baryon minus anti baryon number is the expansion of the universe, and then the full moving baryon asymmetry is constant. Okay. Now, now during there's something called electric failurons that can actually violate baryon number and move it between baryons and leptons, and then and then um, at, at, at sort of temperatures of order the electroweak scale those are relevant. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it's not exactly constant when processes that violate baryon number are operating, okay. but when they're not operating at late times, then it's exactly constant. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. So, the motivation for an asymmetry in the dark sector uh, comes from the fact that uh, you want to explain how to say asymmetric dark matter only makes sense if the asymmetry in the dark sector is of a similar order than the asymmetry in the visual sector. Well, no, not, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, and in fact, there are models where this number is very different from one, and then this is also very different from one in a way that compensates. 
So, so, so really, this equation is the only sharp statement that you can make. If they're both order one separately, then you're good. But the, there are models where there's actually much bigger or much smaller dark matter asymmetry, and then the mass could, in that case, be very different from the proton mass. Okay, so you can have asymmetric dark matter in a very large mass. Yeah, there are models that range all the way from kV to 100 TeV masses. Um, yeah. But if the asymmetry is generated in a similar way, both sectors, do you expect this ratio to be order one or not necessarily? You can, but if it involves different couplings that have different sizes, even so, there, there's a, mo a model actually by myself where, where you're doing leptogenesis to both sectors. And then if the coupling of the right hand neutrino is different to two sectors, you can get very different asymmetries. So, 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 you can actually have a common origin and different asymmetries, okay. but but yeah. but um, their models were be similar, so so I can't really make a. It depends. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So what number are you plugging in exactly in the numerator to get to this like five point four? Right. Um. This and the point one one, and then the other digits I'm dropping that I would have taken from the Planck fit. Yeah. Well, like the dark matter mass you assume in your weak case value. I'm not assuming anything to, to evaluate this ratio. I'm just taking the lambda CDM fit to omega dark matter h squared and omega baryon h squared. These are fit by 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 Planck, for example. Okay. So just take the take the like the best lambda CDM fit from from Planck or in the PDG, and then you'll get some number like that. You, you can check my digits. I well, I'm not claiming. Just, I'm not I'm not right near bar. This the bar is a few percent. But yeah. The, this is just the, the energy densities that we observe. Yeah. And then we know the proton mass very precisely. So we know this side precisely. We know this um, number precisely. And then we don't know um, these. Okay. Any other questions? Um, yeah. So there are many, there are a bunch of mechanisms um, for doing this. People had a bunch of fun back around 2009 after this paper. Just taking every idea that people had had previously for baryogenesis and then doing it in, for dark matter, giving it a cool name like darkogenesis. Um, but for example, you could you, you may have heard of electric weak phase transition is an idea for how the baryon asymmetry could have been generated. You can do that in a dark sector now, so so you could have a dark phase transition um, that gives you an out of equilibrium process that generates this dark asymmetry. You could probe this with gravitational waves. Um, you could have an out of equilibrium decay. You have some state that whose decay lifetime is longer than the Hubble time when it's decaying, and if it's decay, it violates the dark matter number, it can produce this asymmetry. Um, you can also have operators that connect the baryon sector to the dark matter sector and transfer one asymmetry to the other. So, so you can have um, Cl. To X transfer. And, and then you can sort of uh, foresee all the different options. So it could be that the dark matter asymmetry was generated first, and actually the baryon asymmetry we observe could have been inherited from the dark sector, or vice versa. You could take any model of baryogenesis, and then it could have given that asymmetry to the dark sector and give asymmetric dark matter. So, so there are a lot of possibilities, obviously. Or they could just be unrelated. It could be that one thing generated the, the baryon asymmetry and some completely unrelated dynamics generated a dark matter asymmetry. So take your pick. Um, but let me just give you an example of this third case. So if I have an operator with dark matter squared and couples to neutrino squared, this is like the, the Weinberg operator. And if this operator is in equilibrium, um, Exchanging particles faster than Hubble, then it will set. Um, it'll connect the lepton asymmetry to, to the kinetic asymmetry. And if scalarons are also in equilibrium, that will connect the, the baryon asymmetry to, to the chi asymmetry. Um, so this will, in general, set n minus nx to be some order one number times the baryon asymmetry um, when scalarons are active. To figure out what sort of number is, you need to write down the system of chemical. Of equations that encode the chemical potential relations, and then you can figure out the order one number. And in this specific example with the standard model interactions, 
this ends up being the following. Um, but this comes from playing with chemical potentials. Um, and then you could have started with either one, and then so some, you could have created an asymmetry in either sector, and then if this is active, it'll just relate them to each other. Yeah. Um, this might be a little bit of a philosophical question, but because you know so little about the dark matter, why is it useful to be doing research into where a dark matter asymmetry could be generated? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> no but, need but, to answer but, that here. Why is it useful to do any of this? No, um, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I think we're at the stage of enumerating options for where dark matter could have come from. Right. Each of these options, once you write down a model, will map into experiments. Sure. Could that be truly anything, though, since we haven't measured a dark matter asymmetry? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it can be anything that satisfies this equation. Um, but indeed, it could be generated at a very high scale, and this could be a very bleak idea for experiments. So this doesn't really give a sharp reason to expect to see something in experiments. But um, we should know what the options are. I mean, when we evaluate experimental results like their protection or indirect protection, and we want to know well, what does this mean for dark matter, we need to compare that to the different ideas for how dark matter could be produced. Sure. And this is an example. Okay, cool. It's a hard, it's hard. <laughs> not going to tell you, I'm going to lie and say it's easy. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So from this Lagrangian, we derive this relation between these two asymmetries. But can we already get a relation between these two asymmetries in the equation on the left? Can we... Oh, this is observed. Yeah, this is just uh but it depends now on the dark matter mass yes indeed in this model since this is an order one number that relates them the dark matter mass should be near the proton mass okay and that's so what this observation tells you okay but but in other mm -hmm. in other cases these could be very different okay. but indeed so when they're in this transfer case it, it tends to be an order one number that relates them so this transfer case, case tends to be good for several gev dark dark matter okay. indeed that was sort of advertised um Back around then, as this motivates like direct detection that targets a few GEV. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you like models with asymmetry, is it around the same size? Mm -hmm. Sorry, but that's a follow up question because that connects with my question. If that matter turns out not to be light or similar to the proton mass, then this is not motivated. Well, yeah, then this I mean, third one, have... yeah, this third one typically gives order one. These two can be really completely different. Yeah, this is also something called Affleck Dine, which can be completely different. Yeah, so. So some, if there's operators that connect the two with any asymmetries, then you want a few GEV. It, it, there are other cases where they're disconnected, or you could, even if they're connected at high temperature, at lower temperatures, you might create an additional asymmetry. Yeah, so there's really a... And then maybe one last question. Uh, what about the event of detecting that matter in light that matter? Could you distinguish between the symmetry being transferred from the baryonic sector to the dark matter sector or vice versa? Because I assume this has to happen before electroweak phase transition. Yeah, that's hard because you need a spiral. But then, is, do you have some proof of this? Or that's hard. Like, that's about as hard as asking how to what created baryogenesis. And I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but if I did, I would write, yeah. No. But yeah, yeah. If it happened at high temperatures, then it's hard. And that, the thing about it, and it that's, what, that's the thing about biogenesis is it could have happened at very, very high temperatures and the genesis that happens at very high temperatures. Um, if it's something like electroweak biogenesis, then, then we have sharp predictions for colliders and that's very exciting. And then there are other ideas for biogenesis where it's inaccessible to experiment. And the same set of statements apply to asymmetric dark matter. It could be observable, it could be really exciting, it, it could be gravitational waves that you see from this, or it could be very high temperature stuff that we can't probe. Yeah. Oh, well, just processes are It would, yeah, if you, it would follow from relating the chemical potentials of the different states for processes that this relates. So, for example, uh, here you would have like Kai Kai goes to Lapton Lapton, um, the neutrino and neutrino, and, and then this would relate the asymmetries. Or because because it relates to chemical potentials. Okay, but then this is these are auto-equilibrium. Well, no, no. They, 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 in order for to get these type of relation, they should be in chemical equilibrium. Okay. So the transfer, when I say transfer, I mean operators that enter chemical equilibrium. Then those will generically relate asymmetries. Okay. Um, yeah, out of equilibrium is a way of violating Sakharov condition, and that could create an asymmetry. So some out of equilibrium. Process can create asymmetry, in equilibria processes can transfer asymmetries or connect asymmetries. 
Okay. Again, I should say baryogenesis is a big topic that would warrant its own set of five lectures. So, so, um, but if you understand that, then then just copy all that here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And indeed, um, the self interactions, though, would tend to probe the two to two. But indeed, um, at this sort of GEV mass scale with large couplings, that this is consistent with, if you, you naively expect this to be of the size that's interesting for self interactions. So, so, so these models are interesting for self interactions, and self interactions do actually exclude part of the parameter space. But it's still compatible. And actually, that's why I sort of focus on three to two. It turns out if you do four to two, um, that then you're like definitely in the realm where self interactions seem to exclude you, and it's very it's very hard um, for 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 four to two with if it has a standard model temperature. I shouldn't say definitely, but uh, but yeah, but yeah. So 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 it's relevant, and and the positive way of saying it is it would be interesting for self interactions. Yeah, I think it's problematic that this C is negative. Oh, just call dark matter any dark matter or variant. You know, okay. just uh, relabel. Um, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe that would make you happier. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now you can stop. Thank you. Is there another hand? Yeah. So, uh, you think of the, uh, you need to have some of the factory right? Right. Yeah, with the, the assumption I'm making, sorry, is, is that the dark matter abundance comes from an asymmetry. So, so in a symmetric case, then, then, then this relation wouldn't hold. I mean, so I was assuming that the same equation here applies. Um, Yeah, so I was assuming the following. And this is an assumption. This assumption applies to asymmetric dark matter models. It does not apply, say, to the symmetric thermal relics that we're talking about before. And a more careful way to say it, especially with dark matter and any dark matter, that there's sort of an asymmetric combination and, and a symmetric combination. And, and, and so it's really two dimensional space. And then the asymmetric combination can set the abundance, or the symmetric is like the thermal part that can set the abundance. And then you really should compute both, and then whichever one is bigger. Will dominate the abundance. Any more questions? Okay. Now, dark temperature. So for all thermal relic models, there's a dark temperature. That's what kinetic equilibrium implies. So far, I've um, been always assuming it's the photon temperature, but it need not be. And if you're not in thermal contact with the standard model, they will in general be different. Um, so said another way, there's really two cases. The dark sector could be kinetically coupled to the standard model, in which case, um, there's say some interaction exchanging energy between dark matter and standard model particles, um, exchanging energy more rapidly than Hubble parameter, and then this would imply the dark temperature is the photon temperature. And here I wrote it as one interaction, but it, kinetic coupling really applies sequentially in the sense that dark matter could be connected coupled to state A, who's coupled to the standard model, or state A to B, you know, and so on. So really, you should just consider the whole set of things. That, that are connected with something. So it doesn't literally have to be that happens in one step, it could be a multi step, but I'll just write it like that schematically. 
Um, and the other logical possibility is that it is kinetically decoupled, which would mean um, the interactions of this type the dark matter is exchanging energy with the standard model are slower than Hubble. Now, in general, the, dark, the temperature that describes the dark matter is not equal to the photon temperature. But the dark matter might still have big interactions with other states in a dark sector, and they might all have a common temperature. So, so in general, you should sort of separate all particles into different sectors and then evaluate their temperatures. Yeah. I think I'm maybe just not understanding something, but um... If the dark temperature and the photon temperature are the same, wouldn't that mean that the dark matter would be relativistic? So it depends on dark matter mass. Okay. Yeah. So if, our, if the if the dark temp if the temperature is higher than the mass, then yes, it's lower than no. So for the WIMP case, we went through that transition. Oh right. Okay. Thank you. Um. Now. Um. So for example, suppose I have a dark sector in the standard model. Let's take this to be again a dark a dark photon. Um, and I'm going to take it to have a kinetic mixing, which is a mixed field strength, which I think I mentioned before, maybe answering a question. Um, but take this to be the photon field strength and this to be a dark field strength. Right? So the kinetic term of the photon would be this squared. The kinetic term of the dark photon would be this squared. And in general, they can have this mixed kinetic term with dimensionless strength epsilon. Epsilon could really be anything. And it's technically natural for it to be small. It could be 10 minus 10, no problem. Um, and now this, um, you can redefine fields to remove this at the expense of creating a coupling between dark photon and electromagnetic current, which has strength E times epsilon. Okay. And um, this process allow, allows you to exchange energy between the dark sector and the standard model if this decay rate occurs faster than Hubble and if it's lower than Hubble than not. Um, yeah, so the energy Um, we'll just be go like a lifetime. So if we just kind of do a crude estimate, that'll go like epsilon squared times alpha um, times the dark photon mass. And um, we want to compare this to Hubble. So let's ask the question, um, is the dark photon in thermal contact, is it connected coupled to the standard model when the temperature equals the dark photon mass? So then we want to compare this to Hubble um, gamma D and this, um, right. So Hubble goes as T squared over on Planck. So here would be M gamma D squared over on Planck. So if we compare these, um, when they're equal, that would be what I'll call the kinetic boundary, um, which is the boundary between these two phases. Um, and then, so if you equate them, you will find the kinetic boundary occurs over alpha and, and Planck. And this is going to be about 10 to the minus 8 times m gamma d over uh, 1 dB. So if this kinetic mixing parameter um, for mass scales of around GB, if it's larger than 10 to the minus 8, then, then the dark temperature will be the photon temperature, and then the things we've done so far would apply. Um, if epsilon is smaller than 10 to the minus 8, then the two sectors would be kinetically decoupled. And in general, you don't need to talk about the dark temperature and understand its evolution. So just give you an example. So pretty small couplings are big enough to actually ensure kinetic equilibrium because you're comparing Hubble, which is small. So it's really only in very weakly coupled to us dark sectors where you have to worry about having an independent temperature. Okay, but it's still interesting to think about what would happen in such a sector where it does have some temperature. So let's ask, um, how does the dark temperature evolve when it's different? Um, and a great paper on this, um, it's actually by your other speaker, Jonathan, um, 2008.
Um, so let's consider the following framework. So let's take there to be the standard model in the dark sector um, and assume they're connectively decoupled. Um, so we have the standard model characterized by the photon temperature. Um, we have the dark sector it's characterized by the dark temperature. Um, the key idea for analyzing the different temperatures will be to track entropy conservation separately. Um, so we'll be interested in G star S, um, but now we'll want to kind of separate. So this is a G star that will count degrees of freedom in the standard model. And then we can also define a G star that counts degrees of freedom in the dark sector. And I should say everything I'm going to say now also applies to the case where these are neutrinos and, and you're computing the way neutrino temperature is different from photon temperature when we can interaction to So if you're familiar with that story, this is a generalization of that applied to dark sectors. Um, but if you're not familiar with that story, you'll know how to do neutrinos too after this conversation. Okay. Um, so the, the key idea is that in equilibrium, the entropy, well, before we said in, in equilibrium, entropy is conserved. But for kinetically decoupled sectors, we can make a stronger statement in equilibrium, entropy is conserved separately in, 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 in the different sectors because they're not exchanging entropy. In equilibrium, um, both sectors will separately um, conserve entropy. The sector doesn't know about what's happening here and vice versa. So if we define, say, total entropy of the standard model in, in a co-moving volume as well um, the constant, and same for the dark entropy in a co-moving volume. So here I have to find this to be the total entropy, which is going to be given by the standard model entropy density times some co-moving volume whose size goes like a cube. And we have a dark total entropy goes with the dark entropy density times uh, cooling volume. Importantly, it's the same volume that appears in both. Um, we all must learn to live together. Um, that'll be important in a second. Now, the entropy density will be given by the same equation from before, but now sort of applied to each sector separately. We have this 2 pi square root of 45. Star S the standard model, T gamma cubed. We have a T pi squared over 45. G star S star T star cubed. So it's the same term equation from before, but before I kind of had mine everything falling to one G star and now I'm just separating it. Okay. It's useful. It would be useful to define the entropy ratio of the two sectors, and this would be something that's conserved. We use the letter C, um, and this would be the standard model entropy divided by the dark entropy. Um, and then this will just be the ratio of the entropy densities. Um, and then since these are constant, the ratio is constant. So the ratio of entropy densities is constant um, because it's the same volume. Yeah. Um, are there models in which the um, entropy in the dark sector would have a different temperature dependence? That's what we're getting towards. Yeah, I mean, uh, so far I haven't specified the dependence and they're just different parameters. Uh -huh. So, 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 so in general, it'll always have a different temperature dependence. Okay. I, I guess I phrased that wrong. Like a different power of temperature in the equation is what I'm wondering about. Oh, entropy goes like T cubed. That's what entropy does. Um, okay. Always regardless of the model. I mean, the, the thing, the model dependence enters and the question is kind of how does G star evolve? And that could be very model dependent. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And in fact, when we get to the cannibalism, we'll see that it can do pretty strange things. Okay. So, so this thing, is constant and, and we can therefore since it's constant we can think of it as parameterizing the initial condition of the thermal evolution it could be 
Seth by the reheating dynamics, like uh, until time decays a little, the dark sector a little, standard model, there'll be some ratio of entropy at that moment. Um, or there could be maybe some interactions that used to connect them that decoupled, and then at the time they decoupled, you could take that as an initial condition. We could take this, since it's constant, as a parameterization of the initial condition. And then, um, well, yeah, so this. Um, let's evaluate this further. So we plug in the different expressions, the bias cancel, which we just have to start as standard model. Which is star f star t plus my q over t dark q. Um, and then we can solve for the ratio of temperatures. Their temperature ratio. We just take the one third power. Oh. We see that the ratio of temperatures, um, this is just a constant. And then, so the interesting dependence will come from the G stars and how they evolve, and that'll depend on what states are present and then when they decouple. Um, just like in the neutrino case, it, it's, it's the weak interactions decouple, and then after the electron and positron drop out of the G star, then, then, then that shifts this. Okay. So let's, uh, so this would be the general formula. Let, let's apply this in an example just to kind of see quantitatively how much temperature ratio we expect to, to develop. I had a quick question before you get that part. Oh, uh, I don't know, get there. Um, can you repeat for me why we expect um, that uh, the entropy evolution of each standard model versus dark sector is conserved separately? I would expect that they have some kind of total entropy, I guess. Total entropy is conserved, right? That was what we started with yesterday. But um, if the two sectors are not exchanging energy, they don't know about each other, and then they have to separately conserve entropy. Oh, OK. And you can apply to any number of sectors. There could be 100 different sectors. So really, uh, because yeah, the only way you would know about each other is energy exchange. Okay, so sort of we're saying in this temperature evolution, we're saying that this dark sector and this camera are not in contact right now. Yeah, they're not in thermal contact. They're, kinetic, they're what I call kinetically decoupled. If okay. there were kinetic mixing, okay. epsilon is below 10 to the minus eight, and and more precisely, the rate of energy exchange between the sectors is slower than Hubble. Okay. Um, a tiny amount of energy leaking through will not affect this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So what I'm implicitly, so here you always have the photon, so we're good. Mm -hmm. um, for this discussion, I'm implicitly assuming that there are at least one state whose mass is much lighter than T dark, um, so that I, so this is non-zero too. Um, and, and when I get to cannibalism, that will be violated. So, so, so if, if there are no relativistic states, you, this equation still holds, but then you need to be careful how you treat this. The, 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 you can't, the step function approach where you only count re relativistic states works if you have at least one relativistic state. If you have zero relativistic states, you need to be a little bit more careful about what this thing means. And I'll talk about an example later. But yeah, for, for now, let's just assume that there's at least one state that's light, like it's a, like a dark photon or whatever you want. Start at 3.30. You're always trying to steal my time, Yuri. That's too much, too much of a grab. OK. Um, OK. So for example, let's suppose that we start with a common temperature, and this would apply when you have a heavy mediator, for example, like a, that couples to both sectors, that, that maybe you start with a common temperature, and then maybe when you cool, the sectors separate. So let's suppose there are equals, yeah, I don't know, um, at some common temperature that I'll call T0. And let's suppose that this is above the weak scale, 
So above the top, or, so the entire standard model is relativistic at this moment. And now let's take them to be kinetically decoupled. And, and then let's ask how does the temperature ratio evolve down to low temperatures? Um, so let's ask what is m over t dar when t gamma is say an MEV, for example. Um, and this will depend on the dark sector. So I'm going to assume um, that the entire dark sector is lighter than an MEV for this example. So let's take all dark states to um, be below an MEV. So basically, of all of the standard model states between the top and an MEV will freeze out, will decouple. Um, but all the dark states remain relativistic. So we've had a big change of the number of degrees of freedom in the standard model sector and the dark sector hasn't changed. And now we can ask what happens to the relative temperature. Um, OK. Is a question? OK. Now we'll answer it. Um, OK. So we're going to need a few things. We'll need to know what is G star S standard model um, at T0. If you assume just the standard model degrees of freedom, this turns out to be 106.75 when you add up all the standard model states. If there were new particles, like in SUSY, this would be some bigger number, but let's just assume this. And um, we'll also need to know what this is at an MEV. OK, in that case, you have two degrees of freedom for the photon. So we have the photon, and then we'll have some fermions. We'll have four degrees of freedom for electron positron. And then we're going to have the three neutrinos. Um, so that's three times two. This is 10.75. So bet between high temperatures and an MEV, the G star in the standard model drops by this factor of 10. And, and then we're assuming that the G star dark was unchanged. So, so we have uh, G star dark T0 equals G star dark um, evaluated T gamma is one MEV. Um, and we'll just let's just call it, let's just define this to be G star dark. So this is a constant now, it's not, it's not depending on temperature. We just had a dark photon that's massive, it would be three, maybe there's other stuff, some bigger number, it's not gonna matter here. Okay. So now all we want to do is just plug this information into this equation and, and, and see what it means. So so let's start by evaluating C, the entropy ratio. Um, and that again is G star S standard model cube over G star S dark the dark cube and this um is a constant so we could evaluate it at any temperature um but let's evaluate it at t0 because we know that the two t's are equal there and then this um so if we evaluate this at t0 these factors will drop out and this is then just given a g star s standard model at t0 over g star s dark which we said was constant okay so we just plug that in to C. And now if we want to evaluate the temperature ratio at an NEV, we, uh, we want to plug in these G stars at an NEV. OK. So. So we have the C to the one third. Okay, times um, the G star vector. Um, now the standard model will be evaluated at one MEV. To the one third. Okay. So all I did was plug in to the general expression, plugging in the explicit form of C and, and then evaluating these G stars at any of these. Um, okay. These factors cancel. So because we haven't, because um, of this assumption, we haven't gone through any thresholds in the dark sector. So the G star darks. 
here canceled, we arrive that it just depends on G star standard model. One third, which in this case is uh, one of six, one seven five over one seven five. So one third, and that turns out to be about two point one five. So in the, in this example, where we start with the common temperature, we we most of the standard model de decouples. We 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 end up. Predicting that the standard model is is hotter, the dark sector is cooler, but only by a factor of two. Um, so, so if you start with a common temperature, you tend to only develop order one differences in temperature, um, just because of, of these one third powers. So you would need really an enormously large number of degrees of freedom um, to get a big change in temperature after you bring it to whatever change you have to the one third power. Um, so you predict it to be cooler by a factor of two. That's actually really important for anaffective though, because the contribution energy density goes as t to the fourth. So this two, you know, so it's cooler by two to the fourth. So, so in fact, this the, the fact that dark that, that stuff coupled above weak is a factor of two cooler allows you to have several degrees of freedom evade anaffective bounds. So it's 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 important, but at least in terms of the temperature, it's it's uh, just order one difference. Yeah. Um, which part of our setup in this example caused um, the photons to be harder, hotter than the dark? More states in the standard model decouple, and then they kind of transfer their entropy to the other states in the standard model, and then the, that heats them up relatively to the dark sector. It's exactly the same as why photons are hotter than neutrinos after weak interactions decouple, because electron positron decouple and then transfer that entropy to photons, and neutrinos don't get anything transferred to them. So, whichever, if you have two sectors, whichever one ha has more states disappear, um, that, that one heats up okay. relatively. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Um, so sorry, here we only assume that the dark matter decoupled kinetically from the Stefano model while being relativistic. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Oh, okay. Indeed. Um, but this this uh, applies in general, and you can apply this technology to, to more interesting dark sectors that also go through transitions. Mm -hmm. um, I just cho chose an easy case uh, mm -hmm. for my own sake. Okay. So let, let, I want to ask what is the implication of a different temperature for, say, WIMP freeze out? So let's just take the vanilla WIMP, the two to two. Um, but previously, we assumed that it had the photon temperature. So now let's just let have a different temperature and ask what does that mean for the parameters of, of, of the WIMP? Um, yeah, so Consider when light freeze out. T dark. This, of course, is not a literal win because if you're if it's a win being the standard model sector, it will connect to weak interactions, it'll have the same temperature as photons. So here I have in mind like a wimp light dynamics and it can actually decouple the sector. Okay. And well, to kind of explain the difference, first let me remind you what we did before. So let's take the vanilla. Case first, the T dark equals dash plus T. All right, so we have something. Okay. Um, and we reason the following and yield for T quality, and then plugging in um, this result. For n, just 
and then we plug in some estimates. We squirt the burn plane. Okay. And um, yeah, furthermore, because the number density, um, when it's non relativistic, goes to e to the minus and pi over t, the, the, the freeze out happens when the t is on the order of m before the exponential is too small. So, therefore, t freeze out is on the order of m pi, or really m pi over 20, but for now, just to like to remember. So this was before, it was just review. And now, so now um, we can ask, say, suppose um, the t dark is not equal to t gamma. And I'm going to assume that the standard model sector being maybe bigger and having more degrees of freedom, I'm going to assume the standard model sector is dominating the Hubble expansion. And I'm going to assume the standard model sector is dominating the total entropy of the universe. Um, so the entropy is a good measure of Coulomb volume. But I'm going to allow the dark sector to have a different temperature and now ask how does the story change? And, and, and really the same story applies, the same freeze out, same curve, blah, blah, blah. Um, same equation here. The only subtlety is you have to be careful now which t appears in each of these steps. Is it t gamma or is it t dark? So if you and if you're just careful with which t appears where, you'll get the right answer. Um, okay. And again, I'm going to try it down, but here I'm going to assume that that um, standard model dominates Hubble and entropy. Okay, now, so again, we have um, and by, um, well, we can jump right to the second step, and by H over S. Equality sigma b, and now we just want to estimate each of these things. So, so which um, t should appear here? Photon, because because I assumed that the standard model sector um, dominates well, Hubble. Now, now, well, a little more carefully, you could have you could have defined g star in terms of either temperature, and, and you would be fine. But but since here we're neglecting order one numbers, we really want t photon in case there were a higher t. Um, so G star will kind of operate normally in terms of T photon. Okay. Um, what about entropy? The dark. This is also photon because I'm assuming standard model dominates the entropy. Oh, yeah, and the reason we divide by entropy is because the yield appears. So it's because it would measure co-moving volume. So so which it's the total entropy is what determines co-moving volume. Um, so, so, so again, it, it, it's going to be T gamma cubed in, in this case, because you really want the total entropy. Um, okay. And then um, what about the T freeze out? Yeah, this will be dark because it's the dark equilibrium distribution, right? So the equilibrium phase space distribution is a function of T dark. Um, so now, and chi will go as e to the minus and chi over t dark. This will be what appears here. So, so we can, so like the freeze out temperature um, will be um, on the order of m chi. Um, this is t dark. So we can say t dark is on the order of m chi at freeze out. At freeze out. Okay. Um, so if we plug those in, then you, you get. Same expression from before, the equality applying sigma v. And then you'll find this will be times one factor of t dark over t gamma at, at freeze out. Um, because you had a t gamma cubed in the entropy and a t gamma squared in the Hubble, there's one free t gamma, and then that gets canceled by a t dark to figure out the dimensional analysis. So, so you get one power. Um, of the ratio enters omega. And therefore, if you ask what should um, the cross section be, or if you want to match um, observation, before we said sigma v is 1 over t quality m plane. Um, but now it's 1 over t quality m plane. 
multiplied uh, by this ratio evaluated it frees out. Which if it's just a factor of two, like in the prior example, it doesn't matter much. Um, but in principle, for example, a couple dark sectors, temperature could be very different, like a thousand times colder, and then it would matter a whole lot. So, so um, the kind of wimp, to summarize the wind freeze out story from before, where I was assuming that the dark matter had the photon temperature, but if you violate that assumption and ask what the cross section should have, then, then you gain a factor of the temperature ratio times the least scale, which, which uh, for a small ratio, it doesn't matter much, and for a big ratio, it would matter a lot. Okay. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Um, if it's S wave, then there's no temperature. Um, so let's assume that. But yeah, if it, if it's if that's uh, it would be the dark temperature here um, because this this is faster than Hubble. These states are in kinetic equilibrium. So, so in this this cannot be a standard model particle by assumption that it's kinetically decoupled. If 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 this were a standard model particle, then the dark matter would have the same temperature as a standard model. So here I'm assuming the dark matter is kinetically decoupled from the standard wall, so it must be annihilated uh, into some dark state. So, so this this reaction just knows about the dark temperature, and then it's the dark temperature that enters the thermal average. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I wonder what extent because I mean after freeze out, so um, in the case of like. How can we like can we assume that there's never like kinetic decoupling standard model particle and um yeah in in wind models typically there will be kinetic decoupling but long after chemical decoupling it could be right. say for a weak scale it's often say yeah uh, one to 100 MeV, for example. Um, things like direct detection, cross-section bounds will constrain when that, when that happens in specific models. Um, it can't be coupled too much to ordinary matter. Given, or not, there's also bounds from the CMB on this type of coupling. And then typically it'll be in a WIMP model, you'll be kinetically coupled at freeze out and for a long time after, and then at some point before now, it'll decouple. The sort of standard structure formation would assume it's actually decoupled by that point, or else, uh, or else it starts to affect things in ways that are constrained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, if if the dark sector ha has more degrees of freedom, then we would have the opposite conclusion. So, so in the prior case, the reason the dark sector was cooler is the standard model had more states decoupled than the dark sector. Wh whichever sector has more states decoupled uh, will uh, end up being hotter than the others if the dark sector is big. We, we often like to write down simple dark sectors because there's a lot of stuff in the standard model and we're hoping dark matter will be simple. But that is a sort of biased perspective and they have more energy than us around. So we, we might have hell, maybe they're just our, we're a hundred, maybe they're a thousand. Yeah, if it's fewer particles and if you start at the same temperature, then it'll generically be colder. I mean, it, but, but, but the start at same temperature step is very specific that if you have interactions that couple them, like a heavy Z prime at whatever, a thousand TeV, it couples the dark sector, the standard model, like, um, then you would predict to be the same temperature at 1,000 TeV. But if there's no coupling, then it now totally depends on the dynamics of reheating. And you could easily have very hierarchical temperature differences if the, uh, if the inflaton just has a bigger coupling to the dark sector than us, then it'll maybe put all this energy there and it'll start much hotter. Um, so, so if there's nothing like this coupling them, then it's, it's sort of anything goes roughly, roughly speaking. Any more questions? Um, okay, last topic is cannibalism. Um, we might not finish, but we can try. This will be kind of a case where the 
temperature evolution will be more exciting than the boring factor of two, which is what we arrived at before. And this will relate to the prior question. Like what if there's no massless states in the dark sector? Okay. And this was actually been known for a while. It goes back to the work by Carlson. Hatch at all nineteen ninety two. Okay, and so indeed, let's consider like ordered by mass. We have some states in the dark sector, and then there's some temperature be dark, and in general, there are states that are going to be both relativistic and non-relativistic, and the entropy density. Works like this in the dark sector. And then this you would normally evaluate by summing the degrees of freedom of the light state. So you only count these ones that are lighter, and you would not count these ones that are heavier. And then um, you get the usual uh, sum over the boson plus 7 sum. So, I mean, blah, blah, blah. But, but you're just summing over the states down here. I'm sorry, is that just because we can't, we don't have enough energy to produce these higher states and they're just going to decay down? Well, just entropy is dominated by relativistic states. The contribution to entropy okay. of, of, of non relativistic states is exponentially smaller sure. than the contribution for relativistic okay. um, for both energy and entropy. And that's why the G stars you can approximate as these step functions that just sum over relativistic states. Okay. Everything contributes, but the right. non relativistic stuff because of Boltzmann suppression are exponentially smaller. Sure. So the entropy in the universe now is just all the photons. Mm. We're not contributing much. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is sort of the type of thing I had in mind before, but we could also consider the hidden sector with a mass gap. Like for example, if the hidden sector confines a strongly coupled sector, then, then it would all be massive in general. So if you consider this case where there's nothing down here, um, and then the entire sector would be non-relativistic. Um, and then the but then, then this breaks, you can't use a set function approach because you would get zero for the entropy and that's not right. Um, you will be dominated by the lightest state. Um, so let me call this mass M1 and assume it's separated from the second state for simplicity. I mean generally you should add them all, but but the heavier you are, the exponentially relatively smaller the contribution will be. And I'm going to assume for this conversation on um, that there are interactions that set the chemical potential of this state to zero. So I'm assuming now a non-relativistic um, interacting dark sector, um, which could be, could have gone through some confinement. It's all massive. It has number changing interactions. The chemical potential of the lightest state is zero. Now we can ask what's, what's the entropy. So, so now we, we have to be more careful than the prior step function discussion. Um, so we can, well, in general, entropy is given by the um, energy density plus pressure. When you were relativistic, we use the equation of state, and we had the four thirds that appeared here. Um, but if you're non-relativistic, well, then the pressure is small. The equation of state is zero. So this now takes the following form. And if you're non-relativistic, this will just be m times n. And then we can plug in the equilibrium expression for the number density um, from yesterday. Um, G1, M1, G1. And importantly, it's exponentially small. And that's why you would normally not count it if there are relativistic states, but if it's the lightest thing, you have to live with this exponential. Okay. I'm going to rewrite this 
expression as follows. D1. Um, okay, so revert to me. The lightest particle is about the dark temperature. Oh, I'm sorry. We're assuming there are no relativistic particles. No, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. I'm in this world here. Yeah, so it's a. Um, okay, these are different. Okay, okay. Yeah, different, set of different case. Sorry, mm -hmm. so this is before. This is now. Okay. I'm assuming there's nothing down here, and then the entropy is dominated by this lightest state, even though it's not an open dust state. Um, then it's given by this expression. Okay. Um, but otherwise, the same discussion from before applies. The ratio of entropy density between stammerol and dark sector is a conserved quantity. Um, but now we just need to use this expression for the entropy instead of the instead of this expression that we used before. So now we just have to switch to this expression. So what is conserved now? Um, standard model over S term. Standard model as usual. S squared over 45, Q star. Plus standard model P gamma cubed. Um, S dark. Uh, is this thing? Just put that in here. Press start. And now um, you can solve for the temperature ratio. And you will find um, the following expression. And crucially, it has an exponential dependence on the dark temperature. Um, so we see as this state turns non-relativistic, um, the, the photon temperature becomes exponentially smaller than the dark temperature. Or, or, or from the photon's perspective, from our perspective, the dark sector becomes exponentially hotter than us. This is dramatically different from the factor of two that we had when there were relativistic states, this, is, this factor can be huge. Um, and of course, the temperature does always drop. So it's not literally becoming hotter. It's only that we're becoming colder faster is a more precise way of stating it. So, so the implication of this is really, well, the, by definition, T gamma always goes as one over scale factor. And if you plug that in, then this implies that the dark temperature is only dropping logarithmically with the scale factor. Um, so, so roughly, the dark sector is kind of trapped at a constant temperature while the while the standard model is redshifting. Um, and, and and why is that happening? Well, it's because entropy is conserved, but the entropy falls exponentially with temperature. So the only way to conserve entropy, if your entropy would fall exponentially with your temperature, is if your temperature doesn't drop. Um, that's the only way it can conserve entropy. So it's sort of stuck at a hot temperature while we're cooling. Um, yeah, so conservation of entropy implies a dark sector. Um, okay. Now, there was one important assumption that I stated in the beginning, which was this step here. I assumed that the Lightest state it has zero chemical potential. And well, that assumption entered here. If there is a chemical potential, it would have entered the number density in the numerator here. Um, and, and indeed, if the dark sector were inert, then, then it would enter in a way to cancel off the exponential, and this effect wouldn't happen. So, so this, this effect only occurs when the chemical potential is zero, so that the number density really falls exponentially with, with temperature. So, so this mu one equals zero assumption was crucial. Um, yeah. Um, so because our dark matter entropy is falling exponentially, does that mean basically all of the heavy dark matter states are wanting to drop to that lightest state? Well, here I'm assuming you're dominated by the lightest state. So we're really just looking at the behavior of the lightest state. Okay. And now, now the, and then the lightest state like it cannot cool right. because it must preserve its entropy. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so so the chemical potential has to be zero. How can that happen? 
Um, we just means you need number changing interactions, and, and this happens in um, well, well, if you have generic interactions, well, in fact, I mentioned this before answering a question, but if you write down the simplest hidden sector, um, I don't mean n equals four to three a mills, I mean the real scalar with generic interactions. Um, You can think of this as a toy model for blue balls, but if you just have generic interactions, then um oh goodness. Thank you. Um so if I use the four point, um, I think I drew a different version of this earlier, but anyway. Um this lets three phi go to two phi, and as long as this is in equilibrium, um, so as long as n phi equilibrium squared, sigma so d squared is greater than a couple, if this is satisfied, then this, of course, well, it sets you know three times the chemical potential to two times the chemical potential, so so it sets the chemical potential to zero. Um, and in general, you really need number changing interactions amongst the lightest states, so, so sort of three to two or four to two is the way to maintain. The zero kind of potential if you only had two to zero more. Um, so as long as this is rapid, that assumption holds. This analysis holds. The dark sector cannot cool. Um, and it, intuitively, um, well, as the universe is expanding, particles are losing energy to redshift, but the dark sector is not cooling. Um, it's only logs. It's not cooling. So how can it? So something has to cancel the redshift. So 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 what's happening is these three to two interactions are converting rest mass of phi. Into energy of the outgoing states in a way that exactly cancels the the energy loss from the redshift um, from the universe expansion. Um, and conservation of energy tells you it must be so. Um, so the rest mass of phi is converted to kinetic energy in a way that prevents cooling. Um, so in this 1992 paper, they use a colorful language to describe this intuition, and they say um, as the universe cools, or sorry, they say as the universe expands, um, by cannibalizes itself. To keep warm. Yes, yeah, so that's why people now call this type of temperature evolution cannibalism. So it's a conversion of rest mass into kinetic energy, and it gives you a dark sector that's not cooling, which, despite being pretty old, is actually still pretty unexplored. And so a few years ago, people started studying these more, but, but it, it has a different equation of state that, than radiation or, or, or matter. It's something that could have effects on. Hubble expansion that are distinct and uh, are interesting to live. Okay. So I'm actually done a few minutes early. Yeah, I'm not there to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any questions about cannibalism or more, more broadly today's lecture? Um, so this can only happen if your lightest state is above the dark temperature, right? Yeah, indeed. It, it, if you have relativistic states, well, then the prior analysis holds and entropy just drops in the usual way. Um, so, so, so it's really special to, to the lightest state being non relativistic. And this is why it doesn't happen in the standard model. And the standard model sector never cannibalized. And that's because you're always in thermal contact with photons and neutrinos and so on. Um, it, so so it, it's really a different set of assumptions than a standard model. You, you need um, state massive states with number changing interactions, and they must be kinetically decoupled from any radiation. And then you do this, but it is a generic set of assumptions from a model point of view, like a strongly coupled sector could, could easily realize this. So, so it's not strange, but it's, it's just something we didn't do, which is why it's unfamiliar in the standard cosmology. Yeah. Um, so you talk about the three to two for different potential temperature here, and you only were talking about it with SIMs. So do all SIMs cannibalize? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually. Um, in this paper, they wanted five to be the dark matter. Um, in my prior analysis, when I discussed three to two, 
I was assuming that the dark temperature was the photon temperature. So in fact, the prior analysis was secretly requiring another interaction that was unspoken. Um, but 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 you so you have um, your call it chi. In some case, you have this, but you also need to assume thermal contact with standard model um, like this. I mean, then if this is rapid, it would enforce that T dark equals T gamma, and then there'll be no cannibalism. If they're both present, then the, so that's some for SIMPS, it's assumed you're in kinetic equilibrium with standard model or in, gen, in general with, with some radiation so that you have the vanilla temperature dependence and then, and then this sets the relative density. Um, but if, if you turn this off, then, then you have entered the cannibalism regime um, and, evolve and then evolve, evolves differently. So, so you, yeah, you have to kind of ask both questions. What, what reaction removes dark matter and then how does temperature evolve, which depends on, on the full set of interactions. Yeah. So the chair is now telling us the chair from here about 10 minutes ago. Uh oh, sorry. I'm not. Yeah, neither. Uh, can five be X itself? Well, maybe he's asking if, if this can be the dark matter, which is kind of related to this question. That was what was studied in this paper. Um, and the answer is yes, it can be. It, it turns out um, if you start the dark sector with the same temperature as the standard model, then, and then you ask what parameters will give the observed dark matter abundance. The mass scale is too light and the dark matter is too warm. So, so this cannibalism dark matter is, 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 doesn't work if you start with the same temperature as us, but if you start cooler, then it can work, so. so why do you think if your dark sector is not allowing for reaction, what, what will keep it warm? No, yeah, if there's no number changing, then then sort of nothing happens. Is the, yeah, that then then it's just an inert particle like 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 dark matter after, like wimp after freeze out. And and then then yeah, so sorry, if you if you decouple um say, then you'll just typically preserve the usual um equilibrium phase space distribution and you'll redshift with the photons. It's like so something that's for example, if something like neutri like if something is relativistic. And then decouples from other states. It'll it's, it formally no longer has a temperature because it's chemically decoupled, but it preserves the uh, thermal distribution and then just redshifts with photons. So so if this is not present, then then sort of nothing's happening, and and it's just gonna so scale in the normal way. Like you can answer in this situation where TV is lower than the lower mass state. You can you can. Um, because but, but you can just uh, replace TD with T photon effectively. So it'll just it'll just redshift and nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's phase space is locked and it's just redshifting with the expansion. Yeah, that, that's sort of the default case. Yeah. Oh well, that depends on the sign and so on and the size of the cortic. Uh, yeah, indeed, you should pay attention to the vacuum structure. It depends on the on the quartic size. Like take them all to be positive, and the quartic wins out at high field values. Yeah, but indeed, indeed, um, you, you, when you have scalars, you should pay attention to the vacuum structure and check stability. And I'm glossing over that, but it, but it can it can be fine. Mm -hmm. The standard model has relativistic states and it'll do what it does. So, so it's fine. Okay. Yeah. It, okay. The, 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 in the same case, it just has our temperature and, and, and it evolves in the standard way. The, the, the heating up effect only, or the, the lack of cooling is more, more precisely, the, the lack of cooling only occurs when you're not coupled to radiation. If you're coupled to radiation, it's, it's entropy is dominating and you follow it along for its temperature evolution. And, and in the same case, it's just locked to our temperature, no problem.
before we go, just a reminder. So tomorrow there's a, a self-study. Uh, so the first of so 3.30 to 5 p.m. plus there's nothing. Uh, but then uh, John is just saying spill over the discussion. And then the same thing on Friday, so there's like a self-study first, but then there is a discussion. So Josh will be here and Anne will be uh, available. Thank <laughs> you.